I see we've already got the chat active. Thanks for doing that. That's always fun to see where everyone's from. Looks like our numbers are going up. So those who just joined, welcome. Thanks for hopping on. We'll get started here in about a minute or two. All righty. Looks like we've reached an even level of attendees, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Rebecca Bell. It's not Critical Start Events, like it says on here. I am a channel and field marketing manager here at Critical Start. Thank you all for joining us today on this beautiful Wednesday for our Lunch and Learn. No tricks, just treats. Critical Start and Microsoft deliver robust security. Now, before we get started, I wanted to go through just a couple of housekeeping items for you all. This session is being recorded, um, so we will be sending you that recording within 24 hours at post-event. We'll also be using polls today throughout the session. So as you see, there's a right-hand function panel when you're looking at Goldcast here. There's a chat section, a messages section, and a polls section. So once the polls have launched, that's where you'll be able to navigate to to answer those and share your opinions with our speakers. We also encourage you guys to get chatty here today, engage with our speakers and each other in the chat or the Q&A section here. We'll be monitoring those and making sure we're getting those hot questions addressed as they come in. You guys are also all muted, which is great. If you'd like to ask your question live, you can raise your hand and I can then bring you up on stage to chat with Charlie, David, and Sarah here if you want to. So feel free to do that. If not, the Q&A section and chat section are good to go for text questions. We'll also be sending out Uber Eats gift cards, a $25 voucher here at the end of the day today. Um, so you'll see that by end of day today, like I said, in your email, and those will be valid through Wednesday, November 1st. Uh, so next week on Wednesday. Now we've got all the, the housekeeping done, we can get to the good stuff. I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator, Sarah Matzek, Director of Product Management, Microsoft Products here at Critical Start. Sarah, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, those Uber Eats vouchers sound awesome. I hope. I know. I'll send one to you too. too. Speak, let's get them too. <laughs> yeah, guys, thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to keep it a, a pretty casual today. We're having a great discussion with a couple of our experts, Critical Start's very own Charlie Smith, uh, who's one of the principals in our Microsoft services practice, and David Barnscombe, who's a, a Microsoft Global Partner Solution Architect. So uh, you get a couple architects in the room and you always have a good debate and, and discussion about what's happening in the market. So I'm looking forward to uh, walking through a few questions. Uh, as Rebecca uh, noted, uh, any questions, I'll try to do my best to, to jump into the Q&A. Of course, if we can't get to your question, we'll make sure to follow up with you. Um, before we dive in, I do want to take a few minutes just to make sure I provide a bit of the update around uh, what, what's happening at Critical Start, what we're really focused on, uh, and, and how those things align to our Microsoft partnership, which is uh, one of our core uh, premier partners uh, here at Critical Start. So as many of you likely know, um, just by virtue of being here, Critical Start has been delivering uh, managed detection and response services and Microsoft professional services for 12 years. We're well recognized as uh, market experts in that space. but. Over the last uh, several years, we have seen a shift in trend. Um, and so we are moving our business um, really to focus on many of the customer demands that are around cyber risk reduction. I think for those of us who have been in cybersecurity for a good amount of time, recognize the value of uh, endpoint uh, coverage and certainly where there is not coverage or coverage gaps it proposes a significant risk. Similarly, uh, identity, which often is treated as a separate uh, security competency in companies where they have IAM functions, 
vulnerability, uh, rightly generally sits in GRC functionality. But really at the end of the day, what we're seeing is that customers really need us to step up and help them to quantify, assess, and address cyber risk and to treat it as a viable alert that we need to detect and respond in partnership with our customers. So moving beyond the foundational requirements that we all have uh, around building and maintaining 24 by seven operations and to be uh, robust capabilities around orchestration, automation, to drive down those uh, trend numbers in mean time to detect and mean time to respond. That means that Critical Start is really focused on providing customers the tools uh, that are needed to integrate into an MDR offering uh, to assess and alert to some of those coverage gaps, pulling in vulnerability data, uh, running on demand assessments and correlating that against the alerts that we see occurring in the environment. So um, we're really excited uh, to start moving towards those that direction. Many of our capabilities um, are uh, hot off the press. Um, you'll see uh, our business making uh, several announcements around the concept of risk reduction and MDR and how we see that market. Those of you who may be customers today uh, will be extended tools to look into cyber risk in the, in the next coming days. Uh, so that's super exciting, uh, and uh, frankly, it meets the demands of our current customer base and the customers that we talk to every day. Uh, Charlie and David will talk a lot about uh, what we're hearing from customers, what they're working on, and how the Microsoft and Critical Start solutions can address some of these concerns a little more uh, in depth. Uh, the other thing that's really exciting that's happening here at Critical Start is expanding our partnership with Microsoft. So we've recently launched into Defender for Cloud to cover cloud ephemeral and static workloads. Um, it, in addition to endpoint uh, M365D advanced anti-phishing uh, with proactive identity-based responses like um, blocking users, revoking sessions, forcing password resets and such. Uh, the other is uh, we have been um, chosen uh, with several of our peers to be on the security co-pilot design panel. Um, so Critical Start is working very uh, hard to be on the front end of AI from a, a couple of different fronts. Certainly, we're a consumer of open AI solutions, like many of you are, to optimize the delivery of our own business, to bring down costs and to uh, elevate the skill sets and, and query data sets that bring higher value to our business and to our customers. On the other side of that, our customers who are uh, moving into using some of these technologies are actually potentially increasing some levels of risk within their business. Uh, OpenAI is not flawless um, in terms of its ability to provide uh, uh, a, a new attack surface uh, for uh, for threats to move into your business around these really progressive capabilities. So we're really excited to partner with Microsoft and making sure that uh, the Copilot product is introduced into our business and to customers in a secure and risk uh, averse way. Uh, okay, so that was a little update of where we are, a lot of exciting things happening. Um, so with that, let's just move right into the discussion. So guys, I'm glad that you're here. Welcome. Same here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's start kind of at the top. Um, you guys are out talking to CISOs, CTOs, um, you know, IT directors. Uh, what What are you guys hearing uh, around? What are those main initiatives that are uh, that are occurring? That people are making investments around. Uh, you know, my my looming question is: Zero trust still a thing? So, David, why don't you kick us off? Um, so I know I, I know Charlie's view on on zero trust. Um, so in in concept, uh, the the principles of zero trust are still good. Um, there's nothing wrong with the idea of you know assuming breach and and uh, least privilege and and you know those sort of things. The the, the principles uh, for zero trust are good. But as a buzzword, um, I think maybe it's reached a saturation point in the market and and, and people just kind of turn it off. But um, there, there, there are there are still a lot of uh, customers who are interested in, in developing that sort of an architecture in their environment, and that's uh, that's where a lot of uh, Microsoft's 
technology um, is, is moving with uh, conditional access and secure service edge and, and, and those sort of things help uh, uh, drive the, uh, the, the zero trust model forward. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. I mean, I've got some other thoughts, but, uh, but I'll, I'll let Charlie uh, take a. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I forget what conference Sarah and I, you, you and I were at, but we were at the floor and we looked around. I remember seeing zero trust for everything. And I, I was like, yeah. okay, that terminology is, uh, but you know, what Dave was saying, um, so I'll, I'll touch on conditional access as well. And because in the field, um, you know, you know, people are being asked, like, I need more. And there is a framework within conditional access. If you log in the portal and go in, um, there, there's one called zero trust. And that is a really good framework to model off of your conditional access policies. So if you deployed and built your policies three years ago, two years ago, um, th those are things that I like to revisit with, with customers and say, hey, you already own this. Um, you're asked to be do more. Um, this is where we start. This is the North Star. This is how you should be thinking about it. Um, you know, I had a customer that was um, dealing with some attacks around like token exchange. So, um, which we can get into later, but basically theft tokens on an Azure AD sign-in or Entra ID now. Um, and it's like, well, how do we prevent that? Well, guess what? There's a new setting in place uh, in the conditional access and you can prevent that type of behavior. Um, but kind of go back to your original question too, Sarah, around like, what else are we hearing and seeing? And I, I would say consolidation of tools. I mean, people are being asked to, I, I need to tighten up my budget. Um, what else is out there and where can I, I, I had this exact same conversation yesterday with, with another customer. This is very natural. We just kind of start talking about it and evaluating the tool sets and see what we can potentially you know, offset with something else. So, I mean, David, I, I don't know if you were having those same conversations. Well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and for sure, cost optimization is, is, is a big area and that, seems to be driving a lot of movement toward uh, managed security services because there is such a, um, uh, a, a, a gap in the number of, 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 of uh, security professionals that are required by organizations and the number that are available. And, and this is a, a problem that's been developing over a number of years and we expect to continue for a couple of years. So, um, having uh, you know the, the ability to kind of offload some of those challenges with uh, securing your environment and, and tracking threats in your environment. Um, a lot of companies are, are, are rather than trying to hire and build that talent in-house, um, they're going to someone who's already built that muscle and uh, is able to, to deliver you know right out right out of the gate. And then Sarah, you mentioned something that, that, that I've, I've actually been hearing uh, quite a bit lately, um, we're starting to hear um, about concerns at the you know, CISO level of uh, concerns about how AI might be used or misused. And it might be something as simple as um, somebody, you know, not really understanding how it works and uploading a whole bunch of stuff into open AI uh, from their, their corporate uh, stash. Um, that's, that's one way that uh, stuff can be, get um, you know, exposed and uh, unintentionally, but from a more strategic or, or, or maybe even a tactical point of view, if, a, if an organization is going to start using AI, they have to kind of look forward and, and think, you know, can we safely use this or are we potentially risking some sort of an incident where either our own data or data that we um, manage for customers, um, is it going to get exposed somehow, right? If we build our own AI models or our, our own AI tools, what is the risk that, that, that we're uh, creating for ourselves? And so um, I am hearing discussions around that sort of topic. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I think uh, I have gotten the same question over just the last few weeks. And I think, um, again, not to, not to age the three of us, but we're all old. So, um, so you know, looking back at when we were really, you know, I remember unified uh, systems we were really just consolidating uh, IDPS and firewall and everyone was freaked out that 
you know, the firewall competency and the, the IDS competency was now going to, people were going to be at risk for their jobs. I mean, really I'm aging myself and, and uh, there, that there ever was a sense that security professionals would be, there would be too many. Um, so that is definitely not the case, but I think a lot of companies are looking at AI um, or, or, you know, people in functional roles uh, are looking at ways that and considering AI as a resource replacement. And it is the farthest thing from the truth. Yeah, um, it, it, it 100% elevates the speed, the skill, the resource of those people. But I, I, I think by you guys nodding, agree, uh, definitely at this stage, this is not a analyst replacement. Um, it is a, a, another way to elevate the skill or what your teams are concentrating on building great models to detect false positive, to move to rapid detection for um, commoditized response, but certainly not for things that require investigation. So um, any more thoughts on, on that? And it, It's an enhancement for, for sure. I, I mean, um, so I'm, I'm more on the technical side, you know, working with customers, you know, implementing the, these solutions and some of the advanced threat, threat hunting you can do with, uh, you know, this is not a plug, but just it is what it is uh, in Microsoft Sentinel and also in the 365 Defender stack. Um, there's the KQL, the, the Custo query language. And for some folks, this is a brand new query language. It's really easy to use, right? That's part of like, we're very educational approach. Like, hey, uh, we're going to be shoulder to shoulder. I'm going to help you with this. But um, I, we, we've used a lot of open ai it's like i need to write a kql query for this in microsoft sentinel pow 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 done i mean it, it's just you know what the logic you're trying to achieve and it will spit it out for you you might have to tweak a couple things um and you're not like exposing any data either it's just very um you know, these event ids for these systems and this like that uh, it can spit it out really fast it, it's truly an enhancer but yeah that's agreed Agreed, agreed. Okay, so we're going to move into the poll. Uh, we could probably talk about uh, OpenAI. Uh, if you're not using it, uh, it's certainly worth a try. Um, play around with your resume, write some uh, some cool stuff, and then ask a really crazy question about quantum physics or something. And it's really pretty impressive um, to start playing with. And it definitely has a place. So I think that we can all agree uh, that uh, security investigation, response, analytics, and risk will certainly include some elements um, of open AI in the very near future. Uh, okay, so we have a poll question. I uh, really wanna capture what is important to your business. What, what are you guys focusing on? Um, it is a little uh, subjective, I suppose, for some. Um, Good. I mean, it's it's pretty across the board, and these are the things that we would expect, right? I don't think that that there's much that it has shifted dramatically over the course of uh, the last two or three years. Uh, these are uh, all the right things focused on identity. Uh, we'll kind of translate everything zero trust to ability to focus on identity-based behavioral analytics, um, be, uh, identity-based responses. Of course, translating some of those uh, legacy applications into cloud and then le fully leveraging and optimizing uh, a cloud in any distribution, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. Um, great. Thank you very much for the feedback. And with that, we're going to kind of get a little bit of a rubber right to the road here. And let's talk a little bit about um, the challenges that are more specifically related to security operations. Uh, so, David, I'll kick off with you again. And thinking about the threat landscape, what kind of concerns are people raising to Microsoft um, uh, around the, the threats and the ability to have visibility to those threats through the platform? Yeah, so, so Charlie alluded to one of them, uh, the kind of adversary in the middle uh, type of, uh, of, of identity-based attacks. And, and that kind of cuts to the, 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 the core of the, you know, the zero trust story because for you know the, the last couple of years, the zero, zero trust has emphasized use MFA, use MFA, use MFA, and these adversary in the middle um, attacks are able to compromise certain forms of MFA, right? So so they can uh, capture the the SMS texts and phone calls and things like that, <clears throat> where um, where they can then 
uh, take advantage of, of the user account, even though they're using MFA. So um, one of the things that is becoming more important in, in that discussion is figuring out what is the right type of MFA to use? What is the most secure type of MFA? Because we're seeing that they're not all created equal. Right. So using things like, you know, hardware tokens or um, Microsoft Authenticator uh, and, and, you know, the 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 idea behind it being the phishing resistant type MFA um, is becoming more important uh, for customers to consider. Um, another one that's kind of interesting, I, I, I find, is how ransomware uh, attackers are kind of changing the, the way that they approach their attacks um, to account for good EDR tools on, on endpoints. So it kind of used to be with commodity-based attacks that they would deliver some piece of malware to an endpoint. And when the endpoint was compromised, then you know the, the ransomware would run and, and bad things would happen. But because the EDR tools are getting better at detecting that, um, the attackers are, are now running um, remote encryption tools where they'll take advantage of, the, of the, the system process on the endpoint and they'll run the remote encryption from you know, wherever they are. And uh, like there's no files on the machine. There's no file in memory that an endpoint uh, detection tool could, could identify. So, so the, 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 the key here is that they're, they're always pivoting. They're always changing to evade uh, whatever we're trying to do uh, to prevent them. So it is important to be working with you know, either a vendor or, or a solution provider that is aware of these changes in, in the way that attacks are taking place and has an answer for them. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Charlie for other ideas. It, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, what we're seeing in the SOC right now are, are more of these. Uh, I, I'll just pause real quick. Last summer, the way I, I used to pop accounts was like MFA fatigue, right? Uh, that, that was a thing where you used inundate users with MFA, right? Like I would time it, I would do recon against you, find out like, okay, hit your Facebook, LinkedIn, all that, figure out who you are. Okay, um, you're a Kansas City Chiefs game. They play at this time. Okay, that's when I'm going to MFA you, fatigue you. And you'll prove it. I get in and then, you know, establish persistence, you know, either through a, like a like a consent, uh, consent on their behalf to an application so I can get in. Uh, mass download. I, I found just in a very short period of time, um, a lot of, great data. I found divorce papers. I, I found, you know, uh, W2s, w 4 I found all kinds of stuff, right? Just in a, within a 15 minutes. Um, that attack that I used to use doesn't work anymore. Um, so I had to change my tactics, which is more man in the middle, which is, okay, I, I'm going to email fish you, right? There's just a lot of, and if I'm going too much in the weeds, I, I apologize. It's kind of who I am, right? You can, like, we, we've seen it, and this is what I do too. You, you can pop another account uh, that is legitimate. Um, either for, you typically, all, all, um, threat actors we see usually like colleges or schools, because um, usually they're lower fidelity of uh, security sometimes, or easy, easy to, to, to break into, and they'll use that as their launching zone. Um, I'll do something kind of similar. Obviously, I won't pop an actual, you know, about their consent. But I'll use that, and then so any emails coming out of it will be decom signed, will pass SPF. Like it'll look from a basic email so security hygiene, it'll look clean. Um, the URL embedded it, I'll take down my web server temporarily so when it goes through, um, any scanner uh, won't be able to pick up on it because it, it, there's nothing available. I'll pull, pop it back up, user clicks on it, and um, right then. I'm not harvesting their credentials anymore uh, because MFA is kind of, it's not the end all be all. Um, what I'm really looking for is that token, right? So as they authenticate, they MFA on my behalf, grab a token and I'm kind of running rampant. Um, you know, th those are the things that we're, we're kind of seeing, we see in the SOC and there's really simple ways to prevent that behavior as well, so. Yeah, so let's talk about that. Um, I think, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of move on to some configuration risk in a second, but um, this might sound 
pretty overwhelming to some that we have here. It might might be table stakes for others. Um, but I think when you're looking at the approach that a security practitioner or leader needs to take in addressing some of these uh, shifts in tactics and the expanding, you know, what we call the expanding threat landscape really means tactics are changing um, and you got to be ready to, to move when the uh, attack moves. Um, what would um, both of you say just in recommendation on uh, how a, a, a practitioner comes at these problems of kind of first, second, third? How do you prioritize what you're seeing? Uh, you want me to go first? Or you want David to take it first? You raised your hand. Let's do uh, it. I'll take it. Uh, I'll, 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 so anytime I get uh, engaged, the first thing I look at is, you know, where are you at today? So I'll do a quick baseline and just kind of see, um, do a quick assessment of, you know, where you're misconfigured. Um, every environment I've ever assessed, uh, everyone has misconfigurations. And what typically happens is that someone had good intentions um, and did some type of whitelisting, an exclusion list with good intentions. Um, and guess what? Any security tool will honor what you tell it to do. So if it says, yeah, I think this is bad, this is terrible, but there's this exclusion and, you know, it's going to allow it to happen. Um, so that I, I was, so I, I'll do a baseline to see where we're at today and kind of compare that to um, desired state configuration. Hey, this is where you should desire to be at. And if you do these things, right, this will put you in a really good place. Um, uh, yesterday, I had a customer that wanted to see, hey, can NDE do uh, different types of, can it detect like Kerberos, uh, you know, ticket theft or uh, pass the hash techniques? Of course it can. Like, well, I want to see it. So complete transparency is like, I have to really drift. I have to take this instance and radically drift it um, from desired state configuration to allow this. And trust me, everything wants, it's not that the tools don't detect it. It's often, it's radically misconfigured. Um, that's what I typically see is, and that's what people have challenges, I think. I, I did not give him uh, $20 or uh, the Uber Eats card at all, but that really <laughs> goes into our, um, into our risk strategy, right? It really is very much focused on understanding um, configuration baseline, uh, coverage gaps, vulnerability, so that detections become more viable. So um, good inadvertent plug, Charlie, for our, uh, our product yeah, manager focus on risk. Uh, David, any any thoughts on um, how how you and uh, your team would come at um, a, a baseline of approach or, or another approach to addressing some of these more um, kind of current and changing or shifting threats? Sure. So the, the easy answer, right, is always, you know, have the right tools. Um, but having the right tools and not knowing how to configure them, you know, to Charlie's point, or um, how to respond when that tool tells you something's wrong, uh, neither of those outcomes is terribly useful, right? So you need to have a good operational plan so, so you need to um, kind of take a step back and assume breach in, in, in your environment and then imagine the scenarios that would result from that breach. So what would a breach look like? What problems might we face if this set of systems was compromised? What would happen if this set of servers was you know, hit with a ransomware attack or whatever? What's the process for recovering? And then you can kind of go into, you know, how do these tools work to prevent that? And, and how do these tools work to recover from that? But unless you've got a good operational plan, unless you've got solid um, playbooks that you can follow to, um, to understand what to do in the middle of a crisis um, without knowing what, how, how to use those tools, you're, you're already at a disadvantage. So, so, so you want to make sure that, that you've got a plan in place. But yeah. having said, you know, having said that, you do need good tools, right? So yeah. the, the adversaries 
are absolutely using automation. They are absolutely using artificial intelligence to create faster, better, smarter tools. And so it is critical as, as defenders that um, as much as is possible for us, that we're matching their methods and making their life more difficult. Agreed. Yeah. I think uh, something that came to mind for me um, is something that we do coach a lot of customers on. I'm sure both of you um, have had these conversations about untested IR plans um, and the value of those systemically. Um, you know, many IR plans focus on incident responders, um, but if you extrapolate that incident um, playbook out to, uh, to your security operations team or to your managed services provider, um, including your third parties, your vendors, your IR uh, investigators, and the business. What will HR do? Uh, what, you know, where does the business play? Um, and really running through some of those IR scenarios, um, you know, I don't, I can't even count how many times I've been told that we have a great IR plan. And the next question is, how often do you test that plan? And it's we're supposed to test it um, or it's, you know, once a year. Um, I think there's so much value to take those learnings and apply them to where your technology gap might be or your process gap might be or how you can uh, better engage with your vendors um, and partners in those times of, of um, you know, of, of breach, which we all know now is no longer, um, we can't any longer say uh, that, that we don't get breached. Everyone gets breached at some point to some degree. Um, and it's just a matter of how you can handle it, how quick you can remediate it and recover. So. Yeah. Sorry, can I uh, quote Please. Muhammad Ali? Really yeah. To IR. So um, I hope this is Muhammad Ali. This is what the <laughs> always tells me. Uh -oh. he, he goes, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face, right? Everyone has an IR plan until they get breached. and. Um, and there's a lot of truth, truth behind that. Um, because if, you know, I, have been in those scenarios, right. Um, where, where, um, you, you do have a breach or, or you have a, a, an attack that's taken down your sites and, you know, there's financials involved and you get FBI involved as well and contact that. And, you know, you find out a lot about your organization pretty quick about some of those breaches. And you kind of reassess like, hey, where did we do well at and where did we fell, fell at? And where do we have visibility gaps, right? And that's where we kind of reassess like, hey, where else do we need opportunities here to do these detections? So, Yeah, I love it. And um, we're, we're kind of uh, working off a theme here and, and we didn't even plan it. So uh, I love it when a plan comes together. Um, so uh, the next question I have for you guys is, is around what the most important thing is uh, in terms of of tools and process to reduce risk. Uh, so it's really the theme of, of our conversation, but uh, a few of the things that we've talked about here make me think about ecosystem solutions, uh, technology consolidation, and some of the uh, some of the things that the, the group here shared that are their initiatives and what's the common denominator. And uh, what I'm thinking about is the ability for platforms to be flexible enough that you can uh, find and respond to those process or technology gaps without having to rip and replace, um, but then also ensuring that you um, are able to, uh, you, you are actually able to achieve that consolidation cost optimization and deliver the outcomes that the business needs. So um, with the question based on uh, ways that we can increase the speed and efficacy of security operations and at the same time, consolidate technologies, reduce risk, and deliver some of those uh, strategic objectives. Um, how should folks come at these these problems? Dave, do you want to take it, or do you want me to kick that one off? Charlie likes to. He's ready to jump in. Oh, yeah, I got, got opinions. <laughs> 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 Go ahead, Dave. Sorry. Yeah. So. Um, Several years ago, um, and, and and you'll understand the point of the story when, when, I, when I get around to it. So several years ago, I, I, I was heavy in the exchange area, uh, Microsoft Exchange, and um, 
there were some guys that, that were talking and um, complaining a little bit about um, the way that the, the, the exchange was designed and, and marketed to people. And they said that uh, it didn't make any sense to have a whole bunch of features and then emphasize to people all the things that we can turn off. Right. And I thought about that today and um, Microsoft for, for a while has recognized that a lack of standardization makes it really hard to secure your environment. So all of our tools, all the way back from Exchange to you know, Active Directory, the first couple iterations of it, all along we've been providing tools that allow a customer to kind of enforce a standard, a standard configuration of some sort. So when we move to the cloud in Azure, you've got your you know, Azure blueprints, you've got Azure landing zones, you've got Azure policy um, and you know, many others, but, but, but those help you to ensure that your Azure infrastructure is following a set of standards in the way that you deploy, the way that you control, the way that you secure those things. When you move over into Microsoft 365, you've got compliance manager so that you can track the overall configuration of your tenant. Um, in the exchange side of things, you've got con uh, configuration drift analyzer. So you can track uh, like deviations from a, um, a defined standard for email security. And even when you get into data compliance and, and data security, you've got purview and there's policies that can be applied in purview, either at, at the M365 or at the Azure level. Um, so that the, the, the way that you're treating the data or the way that you're treating the systems or the way that you're treating in, inbound email, it remains consistent. Um, with, with devices, you've got Intune uh, that you can apply security controls to, to the devices. So all these things are designed around the idea of creating a, a, a standard or a uniformity within the environment. And when things are uniform, it tends to make it easier to apply a consistent set of security controls and compliance policies to any part of your you know, computing or data estate. So I think it, it, it's important to kind of embrace those, <laughs> those controls and don't view them necessarily as you know, a, a preventing me from having fun kind of thing, but uh, something that, that, that can, can help um, secure the environment and, and protect things in a, in a consistent manner. Yeah, agreed. I think uh, as a process person, uh, the, the only way we can build strong automations or respond uh, to areas of risk or gap is by understanding the baseline understanding what is it what is it meant to be how is it meant to behave so we can see the outliers um, at um, at critical start one of the things that um, we are very proud of is our uh, customer success team and our SOC team's commitment to measuring a customer against a required state configuration so not just walking in the door um, to consume our our managed detection and response capability. Um, you know, if it, it, best case scenario, um, Charlie and his team are supporting a customer to make sure that they are at that baseline and they're able to assess uh, over time. But uh, here we're very committed. I've spent my whole career in, in managed services and uh, it's, it's really great to see that we are with our customers in terms of uh, what they come in the door with. And it's not that old adage of your mess for less. Uh, we're really in it with them and want to make sure that uh, not only do, do we provide immediate value uh, upon uh, delivery of our service, but making that service better and educating the customer over time on the value of, of abil their ability to assess and, and mature over time. So uh, I think we're we're on the same page um, from that perspective. Charlie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I always, when it comes like to Microsoft, it um, can be a catch-22 sometimes. Um, and what I mean by that is Microsoft um, is at a, they're at a blazing speed. 
um, like their development and how fast they release stuff and the preview. I mean, it is so fast. Um, so that that's a good thing, right? You, you went with the technology and the vendor, the software company is putting a lot of, pouring a lot of effort into it. And this is great because um, this week I was working with a customer. Uh, we're doing an MDE deployment, MDE, at least some really, really great new features. Um, and we had to do a quick timeout and pause. Like guys, like we've been tracking this, Critical Star has for a while. It's now out of preview, it's fully GA now. Um, the reason we bring it up because sometimes with preview, right, it, it could change uh, on a dime sometimes. And we don't want to do something that could disrupt the business when stuff is like in, I wouldn't say beta, but it's a preview, right? Um, but like, this is a good time that we should reevaluate. And I feel like this is the right direction we should be taking, right? Get the customer consent. I mean, that that's great, right? Right. No, big win uh, made things a lot easier, but the, the other side is staying up with these changes, right? So if you're evaluating a solution um, within the Microsoft ecosystem like six months ago, you know, I would say even three months ago, um, it, it reevaluated. It. It's, it's totally different. I mean, one of the reasons I went down the Microsoft security stack was because of speed. Um, you know, I, I came from a very traditional, um, like, best of breed background. I mean, I. I did eight uh, bank acquisitions for eight years. We had nearly an unlimited budget and we got the best of the best of the tools. And it was awesome. I, I ran Proofpoint for a really long time. It's a really great product. I ran CrowdStrike, I run Carbon, um, all these really great solutions. Um, but the problem that I always had was speed, it meaning um, let's say that Proofpoint didn't detect something for whatever reason, maybe it's because an exception allowed it through. And then like the question gets brought up like, well, did that make it to the endpoint? What else did they do? And we had to pivot into a completely different console to go look at that. Um, and while we had best of breed, that, that kind of disconnect was, was uh, sometimes a little challenging on how fast we could respond. So years ago, I kind of started shifting and kind of saw what Microsoft was doing, kind of jumped in in the ecosystem. And I know just for us, um, and really me as a practitioner is about speed, um, to, to see all these triggered different alerts starting from like reconnaissance, right? Um, all the way to account, get, uh, email phishing get through, account compromise and all these other suspicious activities all rolled up into a single incident. And man, really quickly, you can disseminate what happened, what is going on in a really fast way. Um, and then I, I swear, I, man, he really drank the Kool-Aid, but I mean, it, it just works. Um, it works really well. And there's times I get feedback from customers like, wow, this generates a lot of words. Like, well, hold up. Like, let's talk about that. Let's talk about why this exists. What is the intent behind this detection, right? Sometimes our informational is more just to let you know stuff is happening, but it paints a beautiful picture when you see a legit compromise. Um, yeah. So for me, it's speed. I love it. Okay, so we're going to launch another poll kind of in this, in this area of uh, consideration. And it's, uh, it's about um, what the most, what you guys think is the most impactful uh, in terms of business risk and, and what you're most concerned about um, in protecting your environment. All right, let's see what happens here. Yeah, this is a good one. This is a good one. Yeah. yeah, like we we just wrote a, a detection for a customer. Um, so they, they got some, you know, high visibility uh, servers, uh, high value asset servers um, that have some right part of MDE, right? It does a uh, threat, threat vulnerability management on it to give you insight on, you know, missing patches and stuff like that. And we wrote a detection that when this gets triggered, oh, by the way, this device is associated with um, these vulnerabilities, right? Is it crit, medium, high, low? Adds context. Yeah, I'm excited about the results here um, for a lot of reasons. One, because I think I think when I started my career, firewall misconfigurations would have been uh, the number one on the list. And I think there's uh, we're all really embracing that there's really not a perimeter to protect anymore. Uh, yeah. Of course, it's not a it's not. Uh, you know, deprecated. Um, we needed to find some some protected uh, you know, ring fenced architectures, um, but it's uh, it's 
it's not surprising that that firewall misconfiguration is at the top of the list. Um, it also uh, really does point a bit towards, um, you know, I'm reading into it a little bit, but that security event monitoring and uh, it, particularly for identity alerts is important, as important as vulnerability is what our, what our group thinks about here. I think that that's probably true, um, but it also kind of speaks to uh, does does that mean that security event monitoring, um, you know, is is a bit of table stakes for people, um, and that it's you know it's we're all expected to make sure that we have a twenty four by seven monitoring solution in place. Um, the key in that one is the identity element, though. Um, the guys have mentioned this a couple of times. Conditional access has helped us to mitigate a lot of risk for customers where it's configured to meet some of their business demand. Um, and that we're uh, able to correlate an access policy to a alert behavior, it really does provide a significant uplift in alert efficacy and our ability to mitigate some of those um, AITM type attacks. Um, so highly encourage the team that's uh, on the phone that if you're leveraging Microsoft to make sure that, that uh, you're looking at the conditional access policies um, and how you can can up your game in that area and uh, we're always happy to help. Yeah, it, on the identity side too, Sarah, there was um, a query that our team uses when we do an engagement. Um, there's a couple of them. One, we identify all uh, accounts that are in enabled states, so that means they can log in, um, that have not registered for MFA. And that's always a little bit of a shocker for, for some folks uh, because you go back to that, you only know, um, you don't know, you don't know, right? So if you don't know that you have like, even at a uh, identity security posture, right? Like who, who, who do not have registered for MFA, right? Um, and in addition to that, we also run, uh, we have a KQL query that we run to identify um, uh, CA policy gaps. Um, hey, in the last 90 days uh, or 30 days, um, what are CA, CA policies that we would have expected to trigger but never did? And that kind of highlights, is it not set up properly? Is it not doing attended? Did someone, um, I had a customer had a, an exclusion list for CA policies, which everyone has, uh, but it was in a part of a nested group and a bunch of people got rolled into this bottom one here and just never applying CA policy. So we were able to so that the concept is like, yep, I got CA policy. It does this. We just reevaluated, but taking a little bit step further, and you know, um, like what David said earlier, it's not that you just go turn this stuff on and say I'm done. It's it's a plan, right? And we go off the of data, and it's really hard to argue with the data. There was thirty thousand signs that never applied um, to a CA policy, which we expected would have, but didn't. Wow, what's wrong with this? So. So for me, yeah. I'm really big on identity. Uh, endpoints still crazy relevant too. Um, we got um, endpoints where, hey, uh, I was doing uh, work with one of our teammates. They said, here, here's our inventory list, and we deployed uh, MBE to it. And part of it has, which I think a lot of EPP EDR solutions have, it does start surveying around it, saying, hey, there's other endpoints around me, and we got brought that up. I'm like, what about these over here? It's like we had no idea. We had no idea. Yeah existed yeah um no doubt i think um uh same thing uh happened to to me earlier today we we're talking about endpoint coverage gaps a customer uh has you know multiple sources of truth of what yeah. they think is the uh you know and it's no longer how many assets do you have uh, qualifying your gap based on your expected total number of coverage or what you're licensed for these are bad numbers um it's really uh, correlation points of anything that can do an asset discovery and correlating that to establish a risk against all those um, uh, asset attributes. It's a complex thing to look for configure for uh, coverage gaps. Uh, EDR coverage gaps is is certainly a uh, a one one to focus on. Um, there's a lot of other coverage gaps, like Charlie was just mentioning, um, policy coverage gaps. So I have it configured, but is it actually triggering the behavior that I expect it to over time? Um, and maybe that means that there's a change in user behavior. The policy um, is not tuned in directly to what your expected outcome is. So um, those of you who are critical start customers, 
uh, ask us about uh, endpoint coverage gaps and, and how we can help you with it. Um, and if you want to put in the chat any questions or thoughts uh, about what you uh, have heard today, uh, what you'd like to see us do, uh, it's an open forum. So please feel free to, to plug, plug in there what you want. I'm going to move to our last question. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes. I think that it's probably a, a, we'll take that time. But if we have a few minutes uh, for Q&A, uh, feel free to, to ask your question and I'll uh, switch over to that panel here in a second and see if I can come up with a couple of questions from the team. Um, okay, so we've been talking a lot about coverage gaps. We talked about some of the strategic initiatives that customers have, some of the specific threats that you guys are hearing about. Uh, we focused on identity, man in the middle type attacks, uh, centralized platforms. I think um, really looking at the, uh, for me, the Sentinel ecosystem um, or as the cornerstone of our Microsoft ecosystem support uh, has has really helped us with some of that speed of operations and being able to be flexible to our customers' demands. Um, but uh, with those coverage gaps, misconfigurations, um, and and configuration drift over time, uh, what do you guys want to to convey to this group on uh, where? You know, how they might approach some of these primary issues of configuration drift, um, the misconfigurations and uh, coverage gaps. Where, where would you have somebody start? Yeah, I mean, um, like, like I mentioned before, there's, there's lots of tools that Microsoft creates to, um, you know, standardize a configuration. So if you think about like Defender for Cloud, um, you're able to apply policies for NIST or CIS or HIPAA or whatever, and apply it to uh, you know all the assets in your in your environment, um, and then <clears throat> uh, get alerts on when those things fall out of compliance. You know when there when there's uh, uh, something that's that's not meeting that standard, and and go remediate them um, or, or or have it auto remediated even, um, and then. You, you can also start thinking about, you know, how do we extend that out to AWS? How do we extend it out to GCP? And those are areas that, that we're definitely working on and, and uh, uh, getting a good story around that um, because it can be difficult when you're dealing with an on-premise environment that's got one set of controls in Active Directory, another environment that's got a set of controls in Azure, Another environment that's got controls in AWS and, and, you know, just keeps going on and on. So being able to, to kind of rationalize those controls across all those environments and saying, you know, this control means this no matter where it's touching, um, I think can can simplify the, uh, uh, the complexity a little bit. Um, it's not going to make it perfect, but, uh, but, but it's going to help. And um, I, I, I think that's that's one of the, the starting points is is figure out, you know, how you can reduce the number of things that you have to configure uh, to to just a few. Right. There's the, the, there's going to be things that you have to configure in two places in some cases, but uh, try to reduce it and extend that that one configuration everywhere so that, um, you know, you, you can have a a measure of confidence that it's uh, consistent across the environment. Yeah, I, it, for me, uh, I usually like to start with um, what your guys' policy, you know, um, do, do you guys allow this, these type of behaviors? You know, is this okay in this your, your environment um, to kind of get that questionnaire? Uh, what that helps drive the priority, you know, is it endpoint that we really need to focus on? Is it more of an um, identity? Um, you know, is it more of like how users are, you know, accessing other, you know, SaaS applications and stuff like that? Um, so, so for example, um, you know, usually when I we kind of go in and kind of deploy the Defender suite um, to to customers. I mean, they, they kind of get like, oh, wow, like they get a lot of visibility in the stuff that they haven't before. It, it can feel a little overwhelming. Um, and I think that's kind of natural, but just kind of, okay, well, hey, like, let's just take a quick pause. But like, hey, here's what we're seeing. 
right? We're having evidence that uh, we have your users signing in um, to access their mailbox uh, from an anonymous IP address. Um, is it suspicious? Yes. Is it malicious? Don't know yet. Um, you know, I've had folks where they want to watch the cricket game from their phone, right? And they hit a VPN and then they check their mail while they're on like a private VPN. Well, that's going to trigger that, right? It's going to come from an anonymous IP address, right? Um, was it malicious? No. Is it suspicious? Sure it is. But the question comes down to is what's your guys' stance on allowing users to access corporate um, you know, data from, from an anonymous IP address? Do you want to allow that? The answer is no. Great. And this makes it a lot easier, right? These are, these are the controls we're going to put in place to do that. So that's where I take it. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can go about it. You can look at the MITRE ATT&CK, you know, framework, you know, work it from left to right and see, hey, what, where are we seeing de detections of the heat map of where that is and where we need to double down on? Um, so you can approach it more of a data-driven perspective, but, you know, there, there's a lot of ways and this is where we say it depends. Um, you know, what's your goals? What do you guys want to accomplish? We'll come with a perception, but we're not aligned with what you guys, what you're doing. Yeah, I think, I'm oh, sorry, David, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and, and Charlie, that, that way of approaching um, the, uh, the challenges is, is very important because, you know, you can turn on all these, these alerts and, and, and you, know, uh, you know, get, uh, get emails and, and, and all kinds of notifications that something's wrong. But unless you know why it's wrong or, or, or why it should be something that you think about, um, it can be hard to determine whether to ignore the alert or, or you know, do something about it. And so, yeah. having having someone like you who has seen what the behavior might be behind the alert, um, explain that uh, can be really helpful in 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 formulating um, the strategy behind remediation yeah. or, or or addressing the alert. Yeah, I'm just looking at chat. Uh, I want to double down on what uh, I think it was JT said. Identity is the new perimeter. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I can do, this is just my, hey, Charlie's religion, whatever. You get what I'm saying. I can do more damage by compromising account in today's world than I can on premises uh, if I hit a box. One of the reasons that we see threat actors still using ransomware because it's crazy lucrative super lucrative that's why they're going after it it's a whole business plan behind it but if you truly want to do damage and take and do data exfil the identity is where it's at um, and that's why i kind of really hunker down on identity because man if you can lock that down um it, that's going to bleed easily into your endpoint as well so i mean that's just my two cents so we're going to get a t-shirt, Charlie's Religion. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll come up with something even better. I'll have it to you by uh, Ignite. By the way, um, team, as we're kind of dialing down, uh, I have a couple of, of last minute things to, to tie out our conversation. Um, but if any um, if anyone happens to be going to Ignite, Critical Start will be there. Uh, I think I think we're even dragging Charlie along. So we'll see if we can come yeah. up with a Charlie's Religion t-shirt for a uh, for Microsoft Ignite. Good name in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has been a great conversation. I think, you know, to end on uh, somewhat of a pragmatic uh, note, I think David and Charlie talking about baselining uh, what your business needs and policy and then applying that across the tech stack that you have at your disposal. Uh, we fully understand that uh, there is a concept of best of breed and people are really holding on to some investments that they have already. Um, doubling down on a, a, a Microsoft ecosystem solution, uh, we get it. We understand that there's multi-tech out there. Um, this team, uh, myself included, is focused on ensuring that our customers understand the value and can in, uh, implement the controls in the Microsoft platform to to. Uh, succeed in, in all the bells and whistles that meet their corporate security policy and what they can consume uh, um, and respond to. Uh, that being said, leveraging a, a technology like Sentinel, which is a critical element of consuming a critical start service, obviously full capability SIM. We have lots of customers consuming lots of telemetry there where we're able to focus on 
uh, identity, user behavior, correlations across or cross vector attacks, building uh, custom correlations um, up to and including uh, KQL and open AI capabilities. So there is, uh, the world is our oyster in terms of uh, how much more we can bring to um, alleviating some of the business risk. Again, uh, we really appreciate you guys giving us the time today. Uh, hopefully you found value in some of the dialogue that, that David and Charlie have had. Uh, we're happy to um, engage with you directly if there's more we can share. Uh, and with that, thank, guys, thank you very much for hanging out with me for an hour. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.